Welcome to Eye Contact, a video news program on issues and controversies in ophthalmology sponsored by EuroTimes. I'm Dr. David Granite. We're here at the Third World Congress of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus in Barcelona, Spain. This year, Lionel Koval from Australia gave a keynote lecture discussing current issues on strabismus. We're so lucky to have him here as a guest. Dr. Koval is director of the Ocular Motility Clinic at the University of Melbourne in Australia, and he's going to be chatting with us today about controversies, developments, and what he's learned in his career in strabismus. Welcome. Thank you, David. Lionel, yesterday you gave a tour de force lecture on what you have learned in the career of strabismus, dispassionately going through what you have uh, done over your last 20 plus years, uh, and, and you hit on some of the things that you noticed might go wrong. What, what kind of categories did you notice might go wrong in strabismus? The, um, the biggest issues with things going wrong are that we still today in the 21st century don't understand a lot of the reasons why strabismus happens. Uh, so we know there are anatomical reasons, things that uh, muscles aren't built correctly. We know there are brain and developmental issues. We know there are genetic issues. And we still haven't teased all those factors out. It's all slowly happening uh, in California. Jodema has revolutionized our understanding of subtle aspects of the anatomy of the orbit. Um, and that's really uh, providing a whole new level of understanding of why strabismus happens in some people. Um, in Northern California, uh, Alan Scott has um, revolutionized many treatment techniques for strabismus to try and uh, make it um, uh, better, um, less aggressive. Um, these are all the things uh, that are happening and will continue to happen. And we, though, have to deal with patients today. Uh, it's always like saying the plane in 10 years will be safer, but we have to fly today. So while the revolution is going on, we have to take care of patients who show up in our office now. What are the kinds of things that you have learned in, in looking back at your career uh, in your analysis for your keynote speech that would help a strabismus surgeon going forward right now? Some things haven't changed in a century. Um, it's important to get high quality information. It's important to get a proper vision test on the child. That has always been difficult and might always be difficult. It's important to get an accurate refraction on a child. Boy, that's difficult. <laughs> And uh, then it's important to make an accurate treatment plan. And that's probably less difficult. If you get the right prescription, the right, the right alignment measurements, the right acuity measurements, it's then not that difficult to make a sensible treatment plan. When you treat, for example, esotropia, what's the most common outcome, not what you want, that occurs? Probably. Um, what the, what the patient doesn't want and what the parent doesn't want and what I don't want is anything that's not a success. And unfortunately, about 10% or so of my patients and your patients and everyone's patients will not be a success. The eyes will not be perfectly straight. The child will need a second surgery. 20% of those who need a second surgery need a third surgery. So um, anything that's not successful is something that I don't want. Do you find an undercorrection or an overcorrection in that setting, or an under-response or an over-response in that um, setting? In, uh, in childhood, the commonest bad outcome is an under-response, uh, an undercorrection. But if you follow a child long-term, 20, 30 years, a significant minority of those kids, maybe one in four, will end up developing a spontaneous overcorrection. In some ways, the operation doesn't grow with the child. So when we reposition the muscle to get the eyes just right and give the child the best chance of best visual development in childhood, as everything grows, as the eyeball grows, as the orbit grows, that perfect engineering balance now goes out of balance. And about one in four kids, the eyes will eventually turn out. Although you didn't talk much about it yesterday, you have done some seminal work in the way refractive surgery and ocular motility 
interact. Given some of the people who might be watching this, can you give a tip to the refractive surgeon on what they should pay attention to so that the patient who comes in with potentially an issue with ocular motility is mm. uh, going to be better taken care of? Look, there are a message to the refractive surgeon. There are so many patients out there who, you, who are going to make you very happy and you're going to make them very happy. Just stick to the really low risk ones. <laughs> yeah. How do they uh, identify uh, the ones that are not low risk? Well, um, I think any hyperope, I would avoid hyperopes. Um, now, there's a lot of selection bias in that sentence, but I see, a, I see one patient every few weeks who's had a bad outcome from hyperopic refractive surgery. Um, so it's, uh, and it's not a reflection on the hyperopic surgeons in my town. Um, I think it's just that the uh, um, refractive surgeons tend to think that hyperopia is the mirror image of myopia, but it's not. No. And um, hyperopic uh, patients are more likely to have lots of other issues. Um, so avoid hyperopes. Um, low myopes uh, who are orthotropic and who haven't been given prisms in their glasses, um, they, they do brilliantly, as you know. And, but just uh, stick to those. So stick to hyperopes and, and ask the yeah. obvious questions. Were you ever patched? You know, did you yeah. ever have eye muscle surgery? Uh, and that can save them quite a bit. Yes. Uh, there are going to be people who are out there thinking about a career in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus, something you've committed your life to. Well, what would you say to the, the young ophthalmologist considering PO and S as a career? Well, you're going to have a great time. Um, uh, I started, I did my fellowship 27 or 28 years ago. And what I, uh, what I just didn't know at that time was that 28 years later, I go to the office every day knowing that I'm going to interact with young children and their parents. And that gives me so much joy and it's so much fun and it keeps me very real. <laughs> and so uh, I didn't understand 28 years ago that how good that was going to be. And it's still really good. Thank you so much for sharing your passion and joy for making a difference for children and adults with strabismus, uh, not only here at the World Society meetings, but on the eye contact program. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for joining us. For more information on this and related topics, visit us at eurotimes.org. I'm Dr. David Granite. We'll see you again next time right here on Eye Contact.